Okay, open your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. Isaiah, chapter 6. We're going to talk about the way this morning, the way God, the Creator, uh, revealing Himself as Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah. Uh, how he confronts problems, how he deal with problems. When God have a problem, that how he deal with those problems. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. And so we're going to talk about leadership. Leadership. We're going to talk about how God calls leaders. And w this is a, a self-evaluation this morning. Uh, uh, we want to hear the call of God upon our lives. And you got to make certain in order to be an effective leader, you got to somewhere in some secret time and place, in some way, you got to know that you're called to do this, that God has called you to do this in life. If you're going to be effective, if you're going to have the longevity, if you're going to be able to go through the trials and tribulation, because God calls us into pain to release pain in people. God is a healer. And he calls his people to enter into the pain of his people and then to shepherdly lead them out of it. Lead them out of it. This is the way God saw a problem. We're going to see this morning. The most important thing is then to hear that voice, to know that this is God's will, and to know he has called you to participate in that, doing his will. Lo, I come, he says, as it is written in the volume of the book, to do thy will, O Lord. Most of our leadership is self-exhortation. We are trying to find our sense of worth and if we're not careful, we'll abuse people and exploit people for our own good in society. And so when God have a problem, we're going to listen to how he solved the problem. We're going to enter into that. We're going to go to the scripture. God has revealed himself in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, and the apostles and prophets have wrote that down, and there's this book here is God's way of human being finding his will. Now, he will guide us by the Holy Spirit and all of that once we get into it. He will help us to know that's his will. That's his will. That that's the whole work of the Holy Spirit. And, and so this morning, we're going to talk about that. And then what I'd like to happen here this morning, I'd like for us to go through a, a sort of a human commission and of his leaders to go back to our neighborhood and give the kind of leadership that God wants us to give. God wants us to give. He, that's the way he, the problem going to be solved. It won't be solved if you don't have leadership. God is a leadership God. He, he don't, he's not a, a driving God. He tenderly calls us. And then he gives us, we're going to see this morning, he gives us vision, gives us vision, gives us vision. We won't be able to see God's face until at the end, but he has placed his image in you and me. And so when we look at each other, this is the closest we can get to God. When I look in your face, but well, one day we're going to see him face to face. Outside of that, now he wants us to be his leaders down on earth, and he wants to lead out of the vision that he gives us. And we're going to see this morning, you've got to get a vision from God. Because without a vision, people perish. And so God leads out of leadership. God leads out of vision in our society. And so we're going to hear that this morning, and we're going to have a good time. Are y'all in Isaiah? Y'all in Isaiah? Well, what I should do first, before even I go to Isaiah, I should give, I do that, don't I? I go through that thing. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, uh, but let, let me let me read the script here, and then I'll go to the uh, I'll go to the uh, give these definitions. 
because you've got to have a working de definition. You know, uh, most, most preaching is like uh, my old friend said uh, 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 he was, uh, went to hear a young man preach, and he preached hard, and I asked Mr. Buckler, how did he do? How did he do? How did the young guy do? And Mr. Buckley went to laugh, and I said, stop laughing and tell me how did he do? And he said, uh, the problem I had with this young boy, he got Zacchaeus up the tree, but he couldn't get him down. <laughs> and, and, and most of our teaching is talking about Zacchaeus, but the issue here is bringing Zacchaeus down out of the tree. So he can, yeah, this is what I want. This is what I want. I don't want. And so this, this morning, uh, we're going we're gonna to teach you about leadership this morning. We're going to have a good time. So let me, let me read here Isaiah chapter 6. This is the call. This is the call to do the will of God. The will of God is everything. Developing and reflecting God's kingdom is what God wants to do to us. And if we can properly reflect that kingdom, and if we can get into the leadership of reflecting that kingdom, he says, seek first the kingdom of God is righteousness, and then things that we need to seek that kingdom with will be made available to us. God has showed us. Most of the time that we are struggling is because we are seeking our own kingdom. We're confused. We're confused. You let the people that think that people think that human power consolidated into one person is what God wants to happen. We don't want that. The church is a collective group of people serving each other and doing the will of God. But there's still got to be a shepherd. There's still got to be a shepherd. The still got to be a shepherd because God is a shepherd and leadership person, being. Okay, so let's listen here at the call of Isaiah here. It says here, in the year that King Uzziah died, uh, I saw the Lord. I saw also the Lord. He was sitting up on a throne, and he was high and exalted, and his glory filled the temple. Above him stood these beings, these seraphim, each one having six wings. With two wings he covered his face, and with two wings he covered his feet, and with two wings he did fly. And they call one to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the doorposts of the temple shook at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled, the temple was filled with smoke. The temple here represents the whole earth, the whole earth. We'll come back to that. And then he said, woe is me, I cried, because I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and my, I, my eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts. Then one of these beings surfing flew unto me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongue from off the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for, forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. And he said, go. I'm going to stop right there. Uh, let me talk a little bit. This is the call of God on a young man's life, probably about 15, 16 years old, who's going to become the greatest prophet in the Old Testament as it relates to seeing and understanding the will of God. This prophet is going to write the handbook for Jesus when he's incarnated. 
It's going to be his handbook. When God calls us, we got to know that God is able to carry out through us that which he called us to do. And you got to feel some little bit of confidence in that. Little bit of confidence that God can carry out through you what he have called you to do if you meet these requirements that God has for you. Uh, better yet, if you sort of just throw yourself into his hand and sort of just trust him. This ain't no work for leadership. This is yielding for leadership. Yielding in order for God to use you. In order for God to reproduce his life here on earth through you. I told you that's what it means to be a Christian. That God is living out his life through you here on earth. And the Christian is the outliving of the in-living Christ. Paul said that. You understand it. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, he says, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so being a Christian is allowing God to live his life out through you as you yield. And you're not supposed to see yourself as being so strong. You need to see yourself as being weak because God's power is made more perfect in our weakness. God resisted the proud. He gives his grace to the humble in life. And so let's take a look at leadership. Let's get the theme on our mind, the call and the will of God. That's what we're going for. You understand? We'll call, we'll, and this morning what we want to do, we want to hear the call, we want to hear the voice of God, and we want to respond to his will. And if we do that, we can go back to our communities and be effective. We can go back there and be shepherd leaders in the community, and that God then is going to work through us his will, and that his will will be done. Because we're going to go back there praying that God's will will be done, that his kingdom would come here on earth. And that kingdom we're talking about now is a reflection of the kingdom. Your, your, your and my work down here on earth is not to build the kingdom. I'm a task is to reflect the vision that is coming of the kingdom that is coming. And so our community should be a reflection, a reflection of what can be. We should be hope builders in the community. But one of these days, God is going to come himself by himself, apart from us, and he's going to build his kingdom, and it's going to be an everlasting kingdom. And he's going to reign, and we're going to reign with him in that kingdom. You understand that? Okay. And so uh, we know our task. Our, our, our task is obedient. Our cat task now is to hear the voice of God, to get a vision from God, and then to live out that vision here on earth, and then to involve other people in that vision, and to reflect that vision, and reflect in a way that other people will follow you here on earth and they are following a vision, our community will grow and develop, develop, grow and develop, and it needs to become somewhat of a, of a why he gonna give other people concepts and their gifts and skills is gonna be there, but we need to be looking at that one vision. The leader's, leader's uh, role, and I'm gonna say that this morning, is to turn that vision into passion, and people will follow passion. They will see the fact that you, you might do this. You might do this. It looks like this guy has seen something, and now I'm, we're going to follow him. And you're going to begin to see that vision begin to merge in the community. You're going to see the healing begin to take place in the community. Y'all went, went to Lundell. I remember going there the first time. They were in a little old a storefront building about a side from here to there, smaller than that. And I went there with Gordy. He wanted me to come down to see his ministry. And so I went down to see his ministry, and it was a cubby hole. 
you, you know, and I, and it was a cubby hole. And, I, and, and then, but boy, he was running around, carrying me all around. He, he was saying, uh, we're going to do this. We're going to get that building over there. We're going to put our gym in it. We're going to get this over here and over here. And we're going to put a help center over here. We're going to do all that kind of stuff. I'm walking around looking at this little guy. <laughs> That's what we wanted you to go out there yesterday so you can see the vision after 25 years of working on it. You're going to see employment. You're going to see one institution providing 400 jobs. And you're going to see them building apartments, saying that because of vision. And without a vision, the people perish. But the idea is to focus other people on that vision and to be the kind of shepherd leader that other people can join that vision. The problem is that we have too much divided vision in the neighborhood. And we all funneling around doing our own little private thing. And we haven't got together to a bigger vision. And what we're talking about is a big vision this morning. So let's, let's go then and look at what I want to say here this morning. Okay, so I better define what is a leader, shouldn't I? What is a leader? I use this two definitions of leadership. Uh, one is President Eisenhower, I like his definition. The other one is Bill Hybel, I like his definition. Bill Hybel says that a leader is one who's able to turn vision into passion. Passion. My vision is for people to look into the Word of God. That's my vision now. And that we bring the Word of God to bear on the lives of the children in our neighborhood and on the lives of the people and that we order our steps by the Word of God. That's the vision I want to end up with. That's what my passion is at. And so if you hear me talking about that, I was so delighted yesterday when, when 500 people went out and bought that Bible. I wished I would have had a thousand. You, you, you know, but, 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 but I want everybody, I want all of y'all to become agents of distributing this Bible in the community because that's my vision. My vision is that we've got to put some more value in these children while they are young, otherwise the media is going to put that stuff in them and you can't overcome it. And so we've got to bring the responsibility back to the home, back to the home. And I said, mothers has got to be reading these stories to the children when they are rocking them. Rocking them in their arms. We got to bring values back to the community. And we got to stop these kids from killing each other on the way to school. This is hideous. Boy, and, and you, would see, you would see it if you would. Uh, we don't get very upset about it. And the thing about us as black, we can't hold no vision no more than three days. Uh, uh, we get black folks together and we can reflect and walk and pick it and do all that kind of stuff for three days. All you got to do in the black community when they do something, just let them, we found that in the civil rights movement. Just let them pick it because they're going to forget about it in three days. They're not going to have no continued vision for solving the problem in our neighborhood. And that we're letting all this stuff, somebody said yesterday, no way I do feasibility studies in communities to find out which one is the most criminal and having the most problem. I just go and count the churches. And the community that's got the most black churches in it is the community that got the most problem. And if you go into the white community in Mississippi, you're going to find a church in every block and they produce racism there. It's no different. They just got different emphasis. They got different emphasis in society. These churches is there, but they are there primarily for them to go to and to worship. They are not there to reflect the kingdom of God in that neighborhood and in that community. They come to worship. They come to have service. That's where they got a church wall. So I go along and say, somebody asked me to come and and do something in the community, the first thing I do, let me do the feasibility. Get me in the car. Where is the tough places? I, I'm going to tell you, don't you tell me where the tough places. 
Let's get in the car, and I see a storefront here, a storefront here, a store. I go in the white community, I see in suburbia, I see all these churches in one place. I said, this place needs help. <laughs> this place needs help. It would seem like that we would want to build a church in the place of the darkest spot. That's where Jesus went when he was on earth. He started his ministry in the darkest spot. And so people could know the light was shining. And they could, let me, let's go now. I keep. So a leader, what is a leader? A leader is a person who gets other people to do exactly what the leader wants done, and they do it because they want to. Because the person shares the vision with them, and they catch the vision in life. Yeah. What is the essential? I need to do that. What is the essential stuff that leadership is made out of? Leadership is made out of our energy, energy. All problems are solved by energy management, bringing energy, people with power. All problems are solved by energy. People energy, human energy is the greatest of all energy because human energy has intelligence. That's number two has intelligent with it. That's the tough thing about religious people. They don't deal with very much intelligence. They deal with more emotion. And that's, emotion can be good if it's got intelligence tied to it. You know what I'm saying? If it got the, in, I, I, we're talking about solving problems. I'm not talking about having religious festival right here. I'm talking about turning our faith into concrete action to solve problems in the community. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not telling you how to have church. Y'all know how to have church. I'm talking about how do, after we have had church, how do we go back to the neighbor? That's the idea of the equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And the ministry is not inside the church, outside the church. And in the church we get equipped, in the church we worship. In the church we sing, we do all those wonderful things. All of that is to inspire us and to educate us so that when we get out in the community, we can be effective into the community. But we make up the one dimension. In my rural Mississippi, all they want to do is to have a church service on the Sunday. They don't serve God. Serve God. Okay, so we got that. Energy, intelligence, and character. 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 People are yinking on that today. God leads through people of, of integrity and character. That's what discipleship is about. It's to confirm in you those spiritual virtues that produces character. That is called the fruit of the Spirit. And so God wants people who are walking in obedience to God. In obedience to God. And, and we saw the thing, if a person has some kind of world influence, and if he have money and have all these things, we'll set that person up in the leadership. We don't care how he lives. But a leader is supposed to take care of his own household. Leaders are not supposed to have but one wife at a time. And now we talk about just a leader. He's going to be my leader. Look, we, just, we care so much for the person that we're not concerned about the character and the moral value. That's what reproduces itself. That's what Jesus came on earth to do, is to reproduce, him, reproduce himself in the community. And we become followers of him in our society. And so no leader is just good enough to lead and do anything that he want to do, sleep around with women and have many wives and all that kind of stuff. That ain't no leadership. That's Babylon. That's Babylon. I, 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 boy, we're not going to achieve anything unless we live in obedience to the Word of God. We have all these meetings, and I don't want C.C. Day to fall into a political, become a political party. I don't want it to just become a, a, a sort of an influential organization that do little influential things. I want leadership, I want this organization to try to model out back in your neighborhood 
this moral character that people can see Jesus in your action. That you've had a vision from God. You've seen a little God. And now you want to give more spiritual, holistic leadership back in the neighborhood. This is important. Our character is important. Okay, okay we got that. Now, let's look then at this leadership. Let's look at Isaiah. Isaiah is a great leader. His, there was a great king, King Uzziah. He had been a great, great king. But in the end of his life, he messed up. You remember that? He messed up. You know what it was? His ego got to him. His ego got to him. He went into the temple one day, and there he was going to make sacrifices himself. He'd done all these other good things, and God sapped him with leprosy. Now, in the next morning paper, when the king went out, they didn't say that God hit him in the temple. You know what they said? The king had a stroke. God met him because he extended his power. He took his fame and his influence and went too far with it. Now, he wanted all the influence was in the nation. And God said, I've got some people there. They're supposed to do that. They are the leaders of this. And so, but for the next, he was such a good leader. His son took over the throne, and for the next 15 years, the kingdom went, didn't miss a beat. And then one day, the king died. That was a sad, sad time. You let God meets us in pain. Because in pain, we can think more clearly, you, you, you know. We think outside of our own selfish need in pain. And so God wants us to, want us to become pain bearers. That's really what he wants to do. He wants to take our yoke, his yoke, upon him and expand that, expand that. If you're not ready to suffer, if you're going to lose all of your time thinking about yourself, uh, that's a dead-end street. You need to be thinking about the vision that God is going to show you. And then see that pain is a means of helping you to be disciplined so you can bear more pain of the people in the community. And so the king died. Now it's time uh, for a leader to be raised up. Not a king leader, but he's fixing to raise up a prophet. A prophet. He's fixing to raise up the premier Old Testament prophet until we come to John the Baptist. You know what I'm saying? This guy is going to be powerful prophet. And he got a task for him. He's probably, he's, 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 a, he's, he's probably a, a grandson, uh, he's a, a nephew, uh, he's kin to the king. That was a dynasty. And so they went into the temple that day and uh, they were grieving. I suspect that on the seat where the king used to sit, there was a, probably a star of David there, draped over with blackness, and the nation was in prayer. The nation was in pain, and Isaiah went in there in pain. And that's the day he gets a vision from God. Let's read it. Let's read it here. We're ready for our, our teaching here. That in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw also the Lord. He was high and he lifted up, and his glory, his robe, filled the temple. Above him was these beings, these beings, these angelic beings. And let's watch him here, these beings. The first thing you're going to see here, you, these beings are standing in the presence of God day and night. They have never seen the face of God. This is an important point here because God has reserved us to reflect his face here on earth. And when we look into the eyes of our brothers and sisters, this is the closest view you can get of God. There's going to come that day when you're going to see God face to face, but that's by and by. In the meantime, he got his face 
seal. And even these beings that's around the throne, they are equipped with six wings. And two of those wings are absolutely there so that they don't see the face of God. They don't see the face of God. You know, I, that's a little driving point in my life. My mother died when I was seven months old. I've never seen my mother's face. You know, I've never seen a picture of her. The, the nearest thing I think about when I see my mother, I think, I think this is why I love her so much. I see it in my daughter, Joni. I have looked at my mother's sisters, and I've looked at their cousin, and I looked at my own sister. And then when I look at Joni, my oldest daughter, it's like I'm imagining that I'm seeing the face of my, of, of my mother. But one of these days, I'm going to see her face. Uh, but the big deal is, I'm going to see Jesus' face. That's going to be this glorious thing. I'm going to see. In the meantime, in the meantime, I've got to go out and look at you. And when I see you, look here, when I see you, this is the closest that I can get. You mean, that ought to make us love humans. I sit around my place all the time. We got some cats. I like a cat I like very much. We got some dogs there. These are bad dogs we got. Uh, and they are bad and big. And I like those dogs, man. I like those dogs. But you know what I'm saying? I like humans a little better. Do you like human beings? I like humans. I like humans. I, I, they, they can't, it's hard to get along with them. <laughs> I, I, now my dog, my dog, my, and my cat, they jump up in my lap. And my, my dog, my, this, this bad one I got, he walk, when I walk out there among him, he comes to me and let me pet him. And I can get along with these dogs, you know, but I like humans better. I like human. That, that's why all the presidents and things have to have them a dog. That's a big deal. Because they recognize the fact that most people are going to be mad with them every day. They got at least one person in that one being they can have fellowship with in the society. Okay. So, so, uh, so, so, so we see this, God. Look, so we get a vision. We get a vision. And the idea here says that his glory filled the temple, the word there ought to be, his glory fill the whole earth. And most of our problems is our vision are too small about God. We think God can fit into our little church house, and we think God can fit into our own denomination. God, can fit. God is bigger than that. And so you see God, the first thing you do when you get a vision from God, we're getting a vision here. We're getting a vision from God. Uh, we see him as a big God that serves you, and you can't put him into your box. You can tell when people have apostated from God is that God hates the same people they hate. And I look at the political system, and I know it's corrupt because the Republicans hate the Democrats, and the Democrat hates the Republican, and, and the Tea Party hates them all. And what they're doing is trying to get us to hate the same people they hate. That ain't Christianity. God is love. He that dwells in God dwells in love. He that loveth not knoweth not God because God is love. And what we got out here in society is a hateful society. The Republicans are hateful. The Democrats are hateful. The Tea Party is a little bit more hateful, <laughs> you know, but they all are hateful. And if you put your trust in them, you're on a dead-end street. God is not with you. God is not on the side of hate and coding it, coding it, hating the immigrants. They hate them. They can hate the immigrants in a democratic society. We can hate them real good and creative because they can't vote. I know how that feel. In Mississippi, I live down there. They made niggas out of us. They could say what they wanted to say because we didn't have no access to power. That's miserable. That's miserable to talk about people who don't have power. We should be looking for ways to empower these people. Empower these people. Integrate them into our society. 
where we can be a true democracy. That's what we want it to be. One nation, under God, from all nations, with liberty and justice for all. You see how we do it? Now we turn around and hate these people. Hate these people. And in fact, if we would hate all ancestors of immigrants, we would be a hating nation, wouldn't we? Because all of us came from somewhere else. It, it don't make sense to me. It don't make sense as I read my Bible. It might make sense if I want to use people to get a political office. But when it's talking about serving God and serving these people who are reflecting the image of God, an immigrant reflects the image of God just like anybody else. And that's the side. We Christian is so vulnerable to hatred. And I hear people all the time talking about who they hate. They don't call it hate, they call it dislike. <laughs> That's a softer word. And, and, okay, let me get it. And so first thing, first thing you see God. First thing you see God. Number two, what do you see in this vision? He sees himself. When I talk to people and they talk about always have been good, and they have never made no mistakes in all of that, I make an assumption that they might not have ever met God. Because you see, when you meet God, you see yourself. And what we see in ourselves first, that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none of us righteous enough, no, not one. All of us are like sheep have gone astray. All of us have turned from our own way. And so when you meet God, you see yourself. I meet these people all the time. They want to work with me and for me. And they, they haven't finished junior college yet, but they know everything uh, in, in life. And then they'll come and tell me they're overqualified. They are looking too closely at themselves. But when you look at God, you don't see yourself as overqualified. It's nobody up for the job that God has you to do. You got to be discipled into that. You got to be trained for that job. And I hear that all the time. Eh, I'm overqualified. Eh, this kind of stuff. You ain't overqualified. When you meet God, you see yourself as a lost sinner in need of grace. Watch this number three here. That's number two. That's number two. We see, we see, we can't get, we see our friends around us. Not only are we doomed, but our friends around us just like, that's a great look at society because all of us are sinners. All of us stand in the need of access to God's grace. God's grace. That's number two. Then number four, watch hit here. Help. You see God in all of his glory. You see him in all of his power. And now you see yourself, and now you see the friend around you. Then, once you see yourself, once you see you in trouble, now you are open up, ready now to begin, almost ready to hear the voice of God you, when you confess your sin. You get the idea? Look what, well, look what happened here. He said, war is me. I'm run. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live in the midst of a people unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hope. Now, when you acknowledge your sin, I want y'all to know that the greatest of all of God's virtues on earth is to forgive sin. That's what he came into the world to do. That is the human problem, is that we are sinners. And he came into the world to save us from our sin. But he also came into the world to provide an eternal blood, eternal blood, to wash away our sin. Look, to, to me, the strongest verse in the Bible as it relates back to us is John 1, 9. I use it every day. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and he's just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse from all unrighteousness. He done that at conversion. But he wants to do that day by day in our lives. 
day by day in our lives so that we can keep that wonderful relationship with him and that wonderful relationship with each other. That's what it takes. And so the Christian life should be a life of confession. Life of con and that's a hard thing. It's a hard thing. I mean, my wife drives me against the wall sometimes. Uh, I say to her, she'll, she'll say, you did something wrong. And I said, oh, honey, would you forgive me? She said, no, I'm not going to forgive you because you're going to do it again. <laughs> and, and what gets me, I know I have the capacity to do it again. So I can't make her that promise. And so I have to keep on pleading with her. Keep on pleading with her. Keep on pleading with her. So, but the forgiveness of sin is the most powerful thing. I don't see why we don't do it. I don't see why we don't. I am not going to put in, get in a narrow box. I'm not going to let people in a narrow box. I'm going to still be a little risky. I'm going to still tell God, Lord, uh, uh, greater your faithfulness. I want God to lead me and to guide me and to help me, but I'm not going to no legal box. You, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to still be a risk to person. I'm, going, I'm not going to assume upon the grace of God, but I'm going to try my best to obey him. And I'm not going to be over conservative. You, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to still take some risk, take some chance in doing what God has called me to do. And so we, 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 we are. We hear, we uh, experience God's forgiven grace. Let's look at that, how that happened, how God prepared us. Verse 6 says, Then one of the seraphim, one of these beings, angelic beings, flew over to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongue from off the altar. And it touched my mouth. And he said, See, your sins have been forgiven. Your lips are clean, and your sin has been atoned for. Now, now, what we can do now, you can't do God's will until your sins are forgiven. You can't do God's will until your sins are forgiven. You, you understand? Your, your hands have got to be clean. You've got to confess our sin. And I've already told you, that is pivot in our life to acknowledge when we are wrong. You know, I envision the forgiveness of sin as a loving God sees me. And when I sin, that he's standing up telling me to confess my sin quickly because he wants to have fellowship with me and he wants me to have fellowship with my brothers and sisters. And if my sins are in my way, I can't have that fellowship. I begin to manipulate people instead of having fellowship with them. Now the sins are forgiven. Once your sin is forgiven, now you're ready to hear the voice of God. Let's listen to the voice of God. This is what this talk is about. This talk is about hearing the voice of God so you can know the will of God. Let's listen to this now. Here. He. What did that stop at? Okay, okay, verse 8. Verse 8 is what I'm looking at now. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, what you've been hearing before has been sound, instruction, but now you're fixing to hear the voice of God. Are you ready this morning to hear the voice of God? In the voice of God, you get the will of God. God is going to speak to us. And he's going to tell us what it is he wants us to do. You remember Paul in that Damascus Road? God saved him when he recognized it was God. For He said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus. I'm Jesus. What would you have me to do? Really, if you read it farther in the Bible, that Paul heard exactly what God wanted him to do. But he really wanted him that to be clarified by Ananias, who was, a, who was a, another child of God. That's why God wants other people in our lives to get it clarified, to get it clarified. You shouldn't act on your own so much. You should act out of some advice and help 
and conversation with people who love you, with people who love you. And so he heard the voice of God. What he heard on that road, you're going to hear him say it later. Paul said it later. He said, he called me to send me far away to the Gentiles. Here is this Hebrew bigot. Here is this Osama bin Laden who's trying to stump out everything and to make his religion only the right religion. And so he said, uh, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus. I'm Jesus who loves you. I'm Jesus. I want you to take this gospel far away to the Gentiles to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to the power of God. And that becomes the missionary mandate that we are stewards of this wonderful good news of God's love, which is the gospel, which is the power of God to bring about salvation. The gospel is the story of God's love for us, the greatest story ever told. So he hears the voice of God. Now let's get, because I meet people all the time who tell me that God told them to tell me something. <laughs> Usually when you hear the voice of God, it's about you. It's about you. It's not so much about me. I meet these folks over there. God, most of them, they're going to end up with God want them, uh, want me to give them a little money. That's where it's going to end up at. That's what it's going to end up at. Don't get confused with that. Don't get, I believe that we in America have deified money. We, we really think that money can do what money can do. I really believe the reason the revival is so strong in Africa is these people are not loaded with all the materialism and that we don't think that more money to get more things are going to solve the problem. Uh, boy, I'm, I'm, in my old age, I'm going that way. In my old age, now I, now I know I'm at the end. I done lived 80 years. I think we got enough money to live out the rest of our life. Okay, I think that. And so I'm more or less looking at money as being a big distraction. I think that we have put too much emphasis on it. Emphasis on it. That, that's why I would like to see CC Day become an organization that is supported by the membership. I would like to see the day that not only would we not have to... Uh, ask for money, but that we would have a surplus of money that we can look at other little struggling ministers out there and see how we can help them. And so I think we are overblowing it. I've looked back to my life in these 50 years. When I have, and I look back and try to evaluate my connection to God and to the community. When we didn't have nothing, but we, God had given us a vision for something, and our money was all gone, basically, that's when we were more effective. And that's when we usually got the money to do the thing that we want to do. As I look back, when I see that we have surplus, and the several times we have had surplus, I see those days as the days when we were trusting too much on that, and we were too hesitant to do the will of God. I, I think money restrains us instead of really helping us to do the thing that we got to do. We got to do in life. And so I'm, I'm going to, I don't, don't deify money. Now you said, you don't need no money. Yes, yes. Let's depend on the Lord day by day more to meet the needs as we go along. Let's see this vision. Let's work on this vision. And more and more, we have got, the church has got to be equipping people for creative work. Otherwise, the reason this economy is going so slow, uh, they done found out they can do much more with fewer people. And what they're doing now is only hiring talented people. And so they don't have, and so people need to go back to school and sharpen their skills, and they need to think of what the new economy is going to be and begin to do some of that in, 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 in life. Well, let me go on. I've got uh, six minutes to finish this. Finish this. And so we hear the voice of God. What is God saying? That's the big thing when we hear God for us. He's not saying he's going to bless me to get a bigger car. 
He's not saying, I'm going to bless you to get a big house. That's what I'm used to hearing people. God told me he was going to give me this house. God ain't concerned about that. God told me he's going to get it. I know how to get a car. It's to save my money and make me a down payment. <laughs> you, you know, I, I saw they really know how to get my daily bread. Is don't go to these slot machine places. Create some sense of saving. All the rich people I know in life, basically I know, are thrifty. Thrifty. We sat around and dreamed that rich people are just spending all the money. You got these fools, these movie stars and all that stuff doing that. But I mean real people who run the real society is not people who are just spending money. And I said, they're spending it wisely. That's why they got it. They're spending it wisely. But we are caught up in consumerism and materialism in our society and using too much on that. What, hear the voice of God. What is he saying? He's saying, uh, he says it here. Um, verse, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who shall I send and who will go for me? That's what God's voice is always saying. God's voice is not talking about all this materialism and stuff. God wants people to prepare themselves to obey him who will go for me. God is going up and down the streets every day. He's in the marketplaces. He's everywhere. And what is he saying? Who will go for me? Salvation is a call to good works. Salvation is a call to do the will of God. It's not a call to do my own will. Jesus came not to do his own will, but the will of the Father. Lo, I come. That's a big verse. As it is written in the volume of the book, he's saying that's what the Bible is about. He's saying the Bible is about God recruiting a labor force here on earth to carry out his will, and God's will is good for the total society. All of us will benefit. In fact, if a few of us in a minute in a, in a community decide to do the will of God, we're going to enrich the whole community. Because God's will is that people would live an abundant life, and that means the basic needs of the humanity to sustain life. That's what abundant life is about. It ain't about just having bigger this, bigger that. Bigger this, bigger that. That's what we, we have become a consumer society. And the church is doing everything at the same rate that the world is doing. We're getting divorces at the same rate. We're doing everything. It, it's not much different between the Christian behavior as it relates to the essentials of life than the non-Christian behavior. We're getting divorced just as fast. We're doing all those things just as fast in our society. We, we are not that much different. And that's what this young generation is looking for. They're looking for different in us. They're looking for to see that we are a different people. We are new creation. We are royal priesthood. We are particular people. We have to show for us the praise of him who called us out of darkness into this marvelous light. Let me finish this. Who, who will go for us. And he says, this is it. The voice of God is calling us to obedience. The voice of God is called. Paul says that in Ephesians 2 when he explains salvation. He says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that faith is not of yourself. That faith is a gift of God, not of our own works, lest anyone should boast. But he says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, which God had foreordained that we would do his work here on earth. And that we need to know what it is. That's called the will of God. And what we are hearing here is the call of God to do his will in the world. And I'm going to end here. What is our response? That's the important thing. What is our response going to be? And how did Isaiah become this great prophet.
Nobody said, here am I. Send me. And know what God always say? Know what God always say? This is consistent in the Bible. God is not a no God. God is not a God that says, don't do it. Don't do it. God is always yes. God is always go. Go, and I'll be with you. And I'll be with you. And I would be with you. Well, Isaiah went, and he wrote the handbook for Jesus. Every move that Jesus made, big significant move he made, he made it in according to Isaiah. What happened to this prophet? God uses him so powerful that he writes the handbook. It's like Jesus, when he was here on earth, it was like he had a stroll of Isaiah that he carried around in his pocket all the time. And whenever he got ready to make a move, he would, move, he would read Isaiah. When he got ready to start his ministry, he got Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. When he got ready to move to Capernaum in the midst of the poor people, he said, the people who sit in darkness would see a great light. And he put the prophetic word to music. For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Young people know all y'all got to do is hear the voice of God. Let's pray. My time is gone. Let's pray. is to hear the voice of God. God is saying to you in this room this morning, who will go for me? Better yet, the Godhead is speaking. Who will go for us? Who will go for us? Who will go for us? Your response ought to be, here am I. That's all you got to do. I really believe that God will come in and undergird you with the rest. I think that what you got to do is get the will. God don't quite go against your will. And so I wish that thousands of you would go back to your community, seeking to know the will of God. And he's going to reveal it to you if you say, here am I. Send me. Father, bless this time this morning. Bless this congregation. Oh, Lord, what a privilege. What a privilege that you have given to us one another. The two or 3,000 of us here this morning, if we would go back to our neighborhoods and to our community, seeking to do your work, seeking to hear your voice, and seeking to obey you. Be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you clap, I don't want you clapping. <laughs> clapping, clapping. This is something I can't wait to get into. I know what's in there because I did the forward. This book represents an authentic, community that based their home ministry on loving God and loving each other. That means our neighbors. This is Wayne Garden's book. I've been waiting on this for years. I want y'all to go out and buy this book, okay? I'm not ashamed to ask you to put, to go out and buy a ministry, a model. It ain't perfect but the buy models that have been tested. So go out and get this book and take it home with you and read it and read it. You're dismissed from me.